imagine being in a place where you would rather have a handout than hand up? Welcome to the county seat. Today we are going to explore that area where some people would choose to be on welfare instead of being financially independent. They are among the ranks of the IGP, not a movement or an organization, but a group among us who don't know how to be anything but lost. Let's start with the basics. Poverty is poverty, right? Well, not here in Utah. In 2012, state leaders were becoming aware and alarmed that a growing number of people on public assistance were there, not because the situation had placed them on hard times, rather because they were raised to believe that that was the norm. Instead of learning how to become self-reliant, leaders believed that children were learning how to become dependent. The belief was children basically learn by example. This would lead to a cycle of poverty that without intervention, the child could not escape and in fact would be expected by the family to stay in. So Utah did something no other state has ever done. They set out to define this unique subset of poverty and do something about it. The law they passed was called Intergenerational Poverty Mitigation Act and it funded research to define the parameters and predictors of this learned kind of poverty. Here's what they came up with. Poverty is divided up into two subsets, situational poverty and intergenerational poverty. Either form of poverty is indicated by a combination of low income and reliance on a mix of four public assistance programs. Cash assistance, public health care assistance, CHIPS or Medicaid, food assistance called SNAP, and child care subsidies. So if both forms of poverty are manifest by public dependence on these programs, how do you tell them apart? Well, it's quite simple actually. Situational poverty is just what the name says. Some life event or temporary situation has placed you in poverty. You know, loss of a job, death of a breadwinner, a medical emergency, divorce, you get the idea. Intergenerational poverty, or IGP on the other hand, is defined by at least two generations spending a notable period of time on some form of public assistance. Basically, it's when seeking public assistance becomes the first course of action for a family instead of the last course, simply because that's the way you were raised. Now, in case you're thinking that IGP families just sit around waiting for their welfare check, it's important to note that two thirds of them work at least part of the year and many full time. Usually the reason they can't work is because they lack the financial or life handling resources to take care of the family and work at the same time. They just don't have the skill set to properly earn and more important, manage money. Without these basic tools most of us learn as children and the good health and education it takes to be self-reliant, they can't get ahead. Add to that the high levels of neglect or abuse that is often present in a stressed home and it becomes almost impossible to break the cycle. This is the same cycle that can create chronic homelessness in many cases. But breaking that cycle is exactly what the state is undertaking with the Intergenerational Poverty Initiative, a set of specifically designed programs to free people from the four legs of public assistance with mentoring, preventative health programs, financial tutoring, education, and early childhood development. The state is banking on this turning the corner, not so much in this generation, but in generations to come. It's a big gamble. So how is it doing so far? We'll get an update from the Lieutenant Governor who is spearheading the initiative when Chad returns with the county seat. I'm Joe Davis. 149 million years in the making. Dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. Let's be honest, you don't know much about Beaver County. 
Well, let me tell you about it. It's the birthplace of outlaw Butch Cassidy and adventure Philo T. Farnsworth. Some of the best skiing in Utah is at Eagle Point. You've got camping, Canyon Breeze Golf Course, Crusher and the Tushers, Beaver Territorial Courthouse, Snowmobiling, Renewable Energy, Pioneer Car Show, Squeaky Cheese, Ghost Towns to Explore, Best Water in the Country, Paiute ATV Trails, Old Frisco Kills, Horse Race, Hunting, Fishing, and it's a good place to live. Beaver County, mountains of fun. I could tell you more, but why don't you come and see it for yourself? Utah Farm Bureau began as a collection of farmers supporting each other to raise the food we enjoy. Today, Farm Bureau membership encompasses everyone, whether ranchers, growers, or just everyday folks like you and me. Members enjoy discounts on items like vehicles and ATVs, or insurance that's very affordable. You don't have to be a farmer to join, and dues are small, but together we make a big difference in keeping our food supply local and abundant. Join Utah Farm Bureau. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about intergenerational poverty and Rio Grande and the, the difficulty people have getting their feet under them. And uh, to continue the conversation, the guy that's been charged at the state level with making sure that they all have a good outcome, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox. Lieutenant Governor, thank you for joining us in the discussion today. It's great to be here, thank you. Okay, appreciate it very much. Uh, before we get started on all the really serious stuff, I want this audience to know that you are a really avid dirt bike rider. It's true. And, and I mean, I've seen you like side hill a couple of things on the way up to your cabin that were pretty impressive. Well, we, we had a good time on, on that trip five years ago. Was it that before long? Before I was lieutenant governor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, got some four-wheeling in and, and some dirt bikes and got to show you our national forest and some of the bark beetle kill and some of the problems we have up there. Let's get down to brass tacks here and, and, and talk a little bit about intergenerational poverty. It, it seems that, that there's, that not only in the public perception, but even in the um, uh, government spheres that people get mistargeted on this all the time. And they think they've got something going that's, that's a great program for intergenerational poverty and they're not even running across these really difficult people at that core percentage that just, it seems like they don't even want to be helped. We get set in our ways, the older we get, it gets a little harder. It doesn't mean we don't try, we absolutely try. But but if we can help our young people to break that cycle, we, we seem to have much more success. We don't seem to, the, the data shows that we can have much more success. They're impressionable, they're anxious, they, they want to they want to learn, they want to have success, they want to, uh, they want to live the American dream. And if we can get them those opportunities, there's a good chance we can break that cycle. But there is a lot of pressure. The, the young man we'll meet a little bit later in the show who it comes, it's their generation, came out of San Juan County. His parents uh, had all kinds of problems on, on assistance, in trouble with the law in Salt Lake, finally broke away and went to Price. And, and he's, he's broken it, but they were mad at him. They, they all, his, certain members of his family basically disowned him for stealing money away from them because he was no longer dependent. He was no longer part of that cycle. We're incentivizing the wrong thing and uh, incentives matter. We're, we're humans and uh, we respond logically usually to things and we have what we call this this cliff effect far too often and that is um, if you if you get a job even if it's a part-time job or a low-paying job the uh, the reduction in benefits sometimes is so great that it's logical not to not to take that job. You're actually better Better off staying uh, staying on on public assistance, and that's that's the wrong mindset. We should be rewarding those that are out there and, and that are looking, trying to better themselves, trying to get on their feet, trying to become participants in the economy. And so I think that's one of the areas where we where we really need we shouldn't we shouldn't penalize a family because one of the kids wants to wants to go out and and, and make a name for themselves. That's that's the wrong the wrong way to look at it. That's a really hard formula to figure out, though, if you 
think about it because yeah. because if if they get a job you reduce benefits you don't want to reward them with more benefits by getting a job because sure. then that becomes counterproductive most people really don't want to be on public assistance and uh, and, and so if you can help them, if you can show them a better way, and, and, and by the way, one of the things we found is mentorship is, is huge. This isn't government programs telling people what to do. These are neighbors that are friends working side by side, helping them, showing them a better way, uh, giving them the support that they need when things get rough. Sometimes it's just as, as easy as saying, hey, I'll pick up your kids and take them to school. You know, kids that are, are, are truant, not showing up because they don't have that family support. Little things like that can make all the difference. I want to kind of shift track here for just a second because we've we've talked about intergenerational poverty we've done shows on it before we've had you on on that in fact I think it was the last time you were on the county seat um, uh, and they see this block of information in the news and they see Rio Grande and the homelessness and they see them as just completely I, I mean I ask my neighbors about it and they don't think they're connected at all they don't think the two problems are interconnected is there an interconnection between them so I believe there is, and in fact, not just with Rio Grande, but just about every, with every major social issue I see right now in the state, there's a connection. And uh, interestingly enough, that connection is a lack of connection. What we're finding is that, especially as, as society modernizes and uh, everything becomes more automatic, more easy, um, the, the social media, the way we interact with each other, we're losing connection with that human connection that is so important. Why does that matter? Well, because it, what it leads to is uh, we, we try to fill that void in other ways, and uh, we're finding it with opioid addiction, and y you'll see higher opioid addiction rates with families that are living in poverty addiction rates. Um, now, that's starting to change a little bit. We're actually seeing upper-class families now suffering the, the results of opioid addiction. But they very could be suffering from the very same thing because the families even with income, families tend to be are, are fracturing more. Kids are more latchkey. There's just there's less connection. People don't eat dinner together. Do you do you think that actually is a big impact? I, I do. I, I absolutely do. That lack of connection, family connection, community connection, and even historical connection. This this uh, we know who we are. This is our our kind of heritage. This is where we came from. Those things matter to keep to keep human beings grounded. And uh, when we start to lose that connection, and, and yes, you do see it w with wealthy families who, you know, they've got their toys and they do this, and, and yet they, they still feel empty. They seem to have obtained everything they wanted and, and there's nothing there. We see it f with families living in poverty and, and the addiction rates there, alcoholism is, is much higher with, uh, with in, in our rural areas and again with those, those living in poverty. And so the, that, that idea of mentorship and of, of coming together is is hoping to reestablish those connections. If mentoring works so well in intergenerational poverty, is there a mentoring component in what you guys are trying to do with uh, Rio Grande and, and, and fixing this homeless problem? Yeah, there, there actually is. And uh, it's one of the things that was really important to us. So we started by focusing on law enforcement. And, and it was critical that we have to hold people accountable. We, we have certain standards. We have certain laws for a reason. And, and they apply everywhere. Uh, there's no exception in the, the five block area that is Rio Grande uh, around the homeless center. Uh, so that was number one. It, Hold people accountable. Number two was get them the treatment they need. So if you're addicted, if you're sick, we want to make sure that we provide you the, the opportunities to become not addicted, to get the, the type of treatment you need. But here's the important one. And the third one is what we call dignity of work. And that's helping people find their inner talents, uh, be able to find a job, get back on their feet. As part of that, we have, uh, we have case managers that, that work together with, with people as, uh, as mentors. They have, they have constant communication, contact, helping them find the resources they need. But we're also doing daily devotionals um, down in that area, in the Rio Grande area. They're open to everyone. They're non-denominational. We have people from uh, different walks of life. We have people who have been uh, previously homeless. We have uh, we have people from different religions and faiths and, and backgrounds coming in. We have uh, self-help uh, uh, people who, who are, you know, who do this for a living. And every day they go down there and uh, anybody can come and you, 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 can, you can learn and you can stay and you can ask questions. We're helping people to find their, their confidence again and have that, that mentoring interaction. How long has it been since we launched this? So it's been six months. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, we just we just kind of hit the six month uh, uh, date uh, a couple weeks ago. So it was uh, it was August time frame of last year. So uh, other than obviously, I've seen a couple of stories in local news media about somebody that that you know made it out. Are are you seeing traction with this? We are. Now the the dignity of work piece we just launched a couple months ago. So that's just been relatively recently, but we've had dozens of people who have jobs now and that's that's a big deal and it's a great start. We've uh, we, it took us a long time to get the treatment beds and we're still trying to add treatment beds. They're very expensive. Uh, it, it's it's difficult. We don't have enough av available and uh, and so we're constantly working on that as well. And and the drug court has been a big piece of this. That's where people can go in and as part of their their plea, they can they can get help. They go through this this uh, this drug court, and we've seen tremendous success there, as well. So we're we're very optimistic. Um, our numbers are starting to come down. We're tracking these things. People can go to OperationRioGrande.Utah.gov website there that shows all of the statistics, uh, all of the numbers, and, and the history of what's happened since we launched this six months ago. The common theme that seems to come across IGP and I mean, opioid is a, is a big problem. It is, yeah. And that was what uh, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative was supposed to handle. And, and that's had mixed results, particularly in rural Utah. Do you think that 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 is a funding mechanism that's making that difficult to work, or do you think there's something wrong with the concept? No, I, I do think it's funding, uh, and that's the problem with all of this, is coming up with enough enough money to make to make all of these pieces fit together in these programs that we know work, but they can be very expensive. And, and so the, the, the concept is this, and it's a, it's a it's absolutely a valid concept. That is, we are spending a tremendous amount of money locking people up. And we can't do that forever. We can never build enough prisons, enough jails, keep people there long enough. If you look at socially, we lock more people up per capita than anywhere else in the world. That's that's kind of what we do. And it, it's been proven not to work. When people get out of prison when they get out of jail, they're still addicted to drugs or they still have mental health uh, uh, issues, right? That, that got them there in the first place. So the, the concept is this, let's, let's try to spend more resources on the front end instead of the back end. If we use the money to do that, we'll save money at the, uh, uh, on the back end. Um, it will actually save taxpayer dollars and it's also a, a much more responsible way to, to do, to help people instead of just always punish. So I think that leads to a question. Does it actually, is it, is it an ongoing thing or do you think that eventually you will start to see that monetary demand start to taper off? I certainly hope so. I mean, that's, that's the plan, right? That's, our, our fingers are crossed. Um, for, for, every, for every child, if, if you look again, at, look at the data and, and evidence-based practices, it really starts at a young age, and that's, that's where we're, we're trying to focus. If you, can, uh, you know, if you can read by third grade, the odds of you ending up in prison are very, very slim. And if you get to kindergarten knowing a, a certain amount of words, I don't remember the exact number, but you're much more likely to read by third grade. So we've, we've got to focus on families. We've got to focus on individuals, helping helping parents help their kids, uh, so that they can they can be prepared, so that they can get to school, they can learn those skills, how to read, how to fit in, and uh, and if they do those things early on, the path will be set. They won't end up in jail. They won't end up on public assistance. They'll end up participating in this incredible American dream where you can accomplish anything and become anything you want. And, and that's what I believe in, and that's why we're doing it. Excellent. Lieutenant Governor, very nice to talk to it's you. It's always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We'll be right back with the county seat. We're going to take a personal look at somebody that has made the transition out of intergenerational poverty and is looking upward in their life. We'll be right back with the county seat. There's a little place on a Utah map where I was raised, where my heart's at, where the sagebrush grows wild and high. The stars come out at night. Oh, there ain't nothing like being raised in the basin with the Ute reservation, skin starvation, that Duchesne County life. The Leighton Hills Mall offers more than just shopping. Bring the whole family and enjoy Sequest Interactive Aquarium to feed the fish and exotic birds, hold live reptiles, and even swim with the stingrays. 
or bump up the action and visit Dartside, Utah's premier soft foam dart tag arena. And don't forget the Great Room Escape where you can challenge your friends to solving mysteries inside themed rooms. So come and experience great fun at the Leighton Hills Mall and visit playindavis.com for other great activities. products have a story of magical places, real people, and delicious recipes spanning generations. So go ahead and discover flavors you've never tasted and friends you never knew you had. Utah's own Discover Local Food. Welcome back to the county seat. So what does it feel like to have hope and a future after growing up only knowing dependence, poverty, and despair? Well, Tyson Benali would tell you that it feels pretty good and that a newfound life with purpose put a smile on his face and hope in his heart. This is the story of one young man who has cleared the first big hurdle on the race of life. Thank you, how's your day going? Great. Okay, household three. I'll be right back. Seven years ago, I lived in Salt Lake City. And I was in a bad part of my life, and then I heard my friend say, if you go to Price City, it's calm. There's, you won't have no friends to get you into the habits that you, you're into. And Get her two potatoes, and we'll put them in the cart, come around to this way. And because my family was doing drugs, and my family was also drinking, and my family was part of my problem, I didn't want to disconnect from them because it's my family, but all, I also knew that if I didn't disconnect, I was gonna still be where I was, and that could be either dead or in jail. Some juices. A lot of people don't understand the fine line between want and need, and want was one thing that I was always doing with my money. I always wanted this, wanted that, but after I took care of all of the want, I didn't have my needs Get an emergency basket here. I've been here for a year and a half now, and just the faces that I see and the appreciation, everybody, the, the God blesses and the thank yous and you, you've saved my life is, is a really, really big emotional boost for me. And I really enjoy that from, from everybody. And that's what keeps me coming back to work. Two cans of every item. Two. I want to finish high school. That's one one obstacle that I have got on the path to, and um, a, a well-paying job so that I could take care of my family in Salt Lake and teach them the steps that I've learned to become better man, better person for the family. Macaroni. Two more cans. Two boxes of like cereal. I said, I came out here with a purpose to know that I can better myself so that my family will be able to see, oh, he's he's done well for himself. Maybe we should all start picking ourselves up. And I, I got a big family, so some of them, like the ones that have been to prison and jail, I, I really didn't write them enough and do enough for them. So I think they would be pretty upset with me because I'm doing better with a better head on my shoulders. Yogurt. Everybody has a potential in life and everybody's purpose is beyond what they think it is. If they think that there's no purpose, find a purpose and find the meaning in the purpose and then you can be able to say, I can help you by knowing my purpose. Okay, and here's your second help. emergency right here. Your first emergency's already in there. All right. So yeah, you have a good day. Bless you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay. Next ticket. 
That's the ticket, Tyson. We'll be right back. south to adventure. Look south to beauty. Look south to San Juan County. Out here, the road goes on forever, and what you'll find will change how you see the world. Climb on your OHV and discover forgotten landscapes and vistas that challenge the imagination. From Blanding and Monticello to the cliff faces of Monument Valley, we're open and ready for you to explore. San Juan County, Utah's Canyon Country. 149 million years in the making, dinosaurs once roamed this land. Now they're found at the Dinosaur National Monument. Let's take you beyond the bones. We call it Dinosaur Land. You'll find it offers adventures and sights not seen anywhere else in the world. Come to Dinosaur Land, Vernal, Utah. You'll want to stay forever. The dinosaurs did. Welcome back to the county seat. Here is my two cents worth. I have to tell you, we've been working on this episode for a long time. In fact, the story and discussion we set out to present was not at all the story that needed to be told. Thank you to Commissioner James Ebert of Weber County for pointing us in the right direction. What is clear to me now is that helping this part of our community will not come from merely creating opportunity they wouldn't know how to use it, or even want to. It reminds me of a conversation I once had with the assistant director of TASS, the old Soviet news agency. This conversation took place in Salt Lake back in the 70s. I stated to him that people in his country must know that we have a better standard of living in America. His response was curious. He said, yes, they knew we had two bathrooms in all of our houses, but that didn't make sense to them. They thought it was foolish, as they had never experienced two bathrooms. And that is the crux of the problem with intergenerational poverty. If you have been on assistance and in poverty your whole life, you can't comprehend the American dream. That is why it will take the next generation to break the cycle. The trick is to get the current generation to let them. I pray we succeed. Thanks for watching today. Be sure to share this with your friends and let us hear your take on this important issue. We would love the dialogue. We will see you next week on the county seat. <laughs>